I'm going to talk about uh, the IAEA's contribution to improved nutrition and health and, and zoom in today on, on body composition and, and breastfeeding. And we'll have another opportunity in two weeks or in early December to talk about some other areas. So today I'll, I'll talk about IAEA and the IAEA's role in nutrition programs. And I want to remind you what isotopes are, give you a few examples of the use, and then also to talk about services we provide. So you were already um, introducing it, Professor Suleiman. It's the IAEA. When you think of the IAEA, you think about nuclear, nuclear weapon maybe, nuclear energy, nuclear watchdog, but the IAEA is more than that. And um, <clears throat> Just to remind you, the IAEA is actually a, a technical agency of the United Nations system with the um, particular aim to, to support its member states worldwide to promote safe, secure, and peaceful nuclear technologies. So we have 172 member states. The headquarters is in Vienna, Austria, and we have a few other offices, but we do not have regional or country offices. So our mandate is to, to accelerate and enlarge the contribution of nuclear techniques to peace, health, and prosperity throughout the world. Um, so you cannot have really health without good nutrition, and that's why the IAEA has a program in nutrition. And here you just see um, in, in a nutshell what the three main pillars of the IAEA are. One is verification, one is safety, and one is science and technology, and nutrition is, is part of that last pillar, science and technology. Um, <clears throat> so nutrition is part of the human health group in the Department of Nuclear Science and Applications. And we work alongside colleagues looking at environment, food and agriculture, water, radioisotope production, et cetera. So very diverse uh, um, uh, uh, area where you can use isotope or nuclear techniques to, to, for assessments or for, for looking into um, conditions and understand why that is. So next slide, please. Coming to the IAEA nutrition program, its aim is to enhance the member states' capabilities to combat malnutrition in all its forms for better health throughout life. We have three themes, early life nutrition, prevention and management of NCDs, and diet quality and nutrition security. And just to remind you, um, we, are, we are very specific with the support we provide. And that's why we always seek to complement um, the work of, of the bigger players in the field of nutrition. We try to see where we can add value by encouraging the use of, of isotope techniques. So stable isotope techniques can be used to monitor and evaluate probes that are designed to promote optimal infant and young child feeding practices or food fortification and supplementation interventions or programs to prevent and treat moderate and severe malnutrition, to just name a few. But overall, when we look at how, what, what is needed to improve the nutrition situation in the world, so one is the implementation of such evidence-based interventions, but we also need to still improve the tools that we use for program evaluation so that we are sure we, are, we need it to improve the nutrition situation globally. And, and one thing is to implement evidence-based interventions um, like the ones I've talked about. But then we also still need to work on improving the tools we're using for program evaluation. And we need to build more capacity to tackle malnutrition. And this is where the IAEA can help with and comes in. Better tools to obtain more accurate data using the isotopes. But we can also help with capacity building through our technical cooperation program. So if you think of a project cycle where the staple isotope techniques can help is, is with need identification and then monitoring and evaluation. 
<clears throat> but before I, want, I, I, I move on, I would like to come back to the word isotopes. And, and you have heard it now a few times. And I would like to remind you what isotopes are. So each element has several isotopes. And those isotopes have the same amount of protons in the nucleus, but they have different number of neutrons, and therefore they have different atomic masses. <clears throat> so if we look at, at an example here, hydrogen. Hydrogen has three isotopes, protium, deuterium, and tritium. Protium and deuterium are stable isotopes. Tritium is not stable, it decays and emits radiation. It's a radioactive isotope. Um, so they have the same, they, they have all of uh, three of them have one proton, but then deuterium has a neutron added, tritium has two neutrons added. So they differ in atomic mass. Deuterium is heavier than protium. So that's the difference. And, and the, from those two stable isotopes, protium is the one that's the most present in nature. Deuterium is much less present, and that's why we're using it as a tracer. We work with deuterium, and I will come back to that. So you have also other elements for which staple isotopes are available and that are interested in, in for nutrition assessment. So those are nitrogen, calcium, iron, or zinc. But you can also use hydrogen or carbon to label compounds such as vitamin A. And then in addition to hydrogen that you've just seen, here you see carbon and oxygen. And again, we work with those minor staple isotopes that are less present in nature, and that's why we can use them as a tracer. So, sorry, you have to click through now. Um, so, uh, in summary, they emit no radiation, they occur naturally, um, but they're less present in nature. Um, and because they are present in nature, we need to collect a baseline sample to see how much everybody has in, in the body. They are suitable for all ages. You can use ice staple isotopes in pregnancy, in lactation, and for children and they can be used in community settings. So what can we use the isotopes for? So nuclear, including staple isotopes, can be used for a number of assessments. So for example, to assess protein quality digestion from foods. You can use it to measure micronutrient bioavailability, especially uh, iron and zinc in the context of food fortification or, or biofortification. You can use it to assess uh, vitamin A body stores to understand the effect of intervention uh, to prevent vitamin A deficiency. Or you can use it in the context of environmental enteric dysfunction to understand whether nutrient absorption is impaired due to living in unsanitary conditions. And then you can use it to assess body composition, and I will come back to this in a minute. You can also use the isotopes to assess total energy expenditure, to estimate energy requirements or validate measurements of physical activity, or to validate dietary assessment tools. And then there's a nuclear technique that can be used to assess bone mineral density, for example, in the context of osteoporosis prevention. So the IAEA has two main mechanisms to support the member states. And, and, and one is the coordinated research process where we define a research question, we call for proposals, we bring together a small group of, of uh, research institutions for four to five years, we provide small annual grants, and then we bring everyone together in regular coordination meetings. So this is something that's very much driven by us, the small team of nutrition specialists sitting in Vienna. And then in contrast to that, we have the technical cooperation program, which is really driven by our member states. It's based upon requests from the member states. So projects can be requested in a biannual planning cycle. And its aim is really to build and strengthen capacity 
in the use of stable isotope techniques. So what, what is being provided? Training, expert advice, equipment or consumables that are needed to use the isotopes. But we can also support sample analysis or even data management and analysis. So now I come back to the theme of body composition. I've, I've mentioned it a few times. Why, why is this important that we look at, at body composition and not just weight or height and, and the, the, the body mass index I'm sure you're all familiar with? Um, well, the BMI can be misleading. Look at this example here. So this bodybuilder on the, on the left side has a very high BMI, but he has a high BMI because of a lot of muscle mass. The second person has a high BMI, um, a high BMI because of a high percent body fat. So if you just look at the BMI, you think they're both obese, but they're not. And for that, you need to understand and measure body composition. Same here on the right-hand side. Uh, those two gentlemen have the exactly same body mass index, but they have very different percent body fat. And why is this important? Because they have a different risk then of developing non-communicable diseases. And that's why we, the, we care about body composition and why we want to know more than just weight. So when I talk about body composition, this is, this is what I mean. So just um, having the body divided very simply in fat and fat-free mass, and then you have the different components in the fat-free mass. And um, to show you how the uh, isotope technique here, the deuterium dilution technique works to assess body composition, I would like to walk you through the different steps and you will hear this again in the next presentation. So you have to take a baseline sample to see how much deuterium is in the body already. So here it's a baseline sample of saliva. Then you administer the deuterium oxide, a dose of deuterium oxide. This has to equilibrate with the body for three to four hours. Then you collect a post dose sample after three to four hours. You measure the deuterium abundance and you can calculate the total body water from the deuterium abundance. And from there, the fat-free mass. And then fat mass is just simply the difference between body weight and fat-free mass. So this is in a nutshell how the technique works. It takes about three to four hours to complete. So when are body composition data important? So one is it, you, you can use it to just look at natural changes as individual grows, how, how body composition changes. You can use it to generate more accurate data on childhood obesity or look at long-term effects of acute malnutrition or assess the effect of interventions to treat acute malnutrition or prevent obesity. So here is um, a slide that shows results from, from two uh, IAEA supported projects, regional projects, one in Africa, one in Asia. And it's just to, to illustrate again, like if you just look at measures of weight and height, and, and in this case here, it's children. So BMI for BMI Z scores for age, you would um, sort of underestimate the prevalence of overweight and obesity than uh, if you look at percent body fat, if you measure directly body fatness or adiposity, which you see here in the light green bar. So if we are using the, the BMI to, to, um, uh, uh, to identify our target group for interventions like the overweight and obese, we might miss, we might underestimate that, uh, uh, that population because we're not directly measuring body fatness or adiposity. So again, that's why um, body composition is important. 
Um, we have an ongoing research project that, um, that looks at the link between early life nutrition and la later childhood health. And it is to, to look at the relationship between the first thousand days and, and later childhood body composition and how interventions um, change uh, body composition. Um, another interesting example here from Ethiopia is, is um, showing that fat-free mass at birth is positively associated with brain development in the first five years of life. So if you would just look at birth weight, it wouldn't give you that same information. So, so much about body composition. You hear a bit more about body composition in the next presentation. So now I would like to turn to breastfeeding. What is IAEA's role in breastfeeding promotion? So staple isotopes can be used to assess breastfeeding practices, to quantify how much breast milk an infant consumes, but also to accurately um, assess exclusive breastfeeding and whether an infant is exclusively breastfed. So isotope techniques can be used to assess the impact of interventions to promote optimal breastfeeding practices, and um, they can help to, to monitor progress of achieving the World Health Assembly target on exclusive breastfeeding. So here you see a number of studies that have been conducted in different countries. Um, they compare exclusive breastfeeding in the first six months of life based on maternal recall data, which is the green bar here, and based on the use of the isotope technique, the deuterium oxide dose to mother technique, which are the purple bars. So exclusive breastfeeding rates are lower when the objective isotope technique is used compared to the maternal recall. You can also relate exclusive breastfeeding with body composition. So here's an example from South Africa. Um, and results show that infants who were exclusively breastfed for six months had a higher percent fat-free mass at 12 months compared with infants who were not exclusively breastfed for six months. And here is a, um, a slide that shows the different amounts of breast milk consumed. And it's, it's data from over a thousand mother baby pairs from Africa, Asia Pacific and Latin America that we have compiled and, and used here. And, and you see, when you look at the amount of breast milk um, per, in grams per day, you see that this goes up. Um, during the first six months, but it gradually decreases here, the, the gray part of it, when you look at the amount expressed as gram per day per kilogram body weight. Um, we also looked with the regional differences and, and um, you can't really see any difference when the uh, amount is expressed relative to the infant's body weight. So how does that uh, method work? This is just, again, in a nutshell, you will hear more from the uh, presentations based on Indonesian data. So mother consumes uh, a dose of deuterium. The deuterium mixes with the mother's body water. The infant consumes the deuterium through the mother's milk. And then saliva samples are taken from the mother and the infant several times over a period of two weeks. The amount of deuterium is analyzed, and then the amount of breast milk consumed and the amount of water from sources other than breast milk is calculated. So <clears throat> that's all about breastfeeding. Again, you hear more from the, the experiences in, in Indonesia. Before ending, I, I just would like to summarize for you the different services the IAEA provides. We develop guidance documents, we provide education and training, we help compile databases and host databases, and we conduct interlaboratory studies. So here you have some of the guidance documents that we have prepared. There are eight different ones on different isotopic techniques. 
So five e-learning modules that complement the guidance document. And we produce fact sheets and flyers to disseminate information on the use of isotope techniques in nutrition assessments. We inform about the latest activities and news in biannual newsletters, and you can sign up for this if you want to keep up to date. And all of that information that I was talking about is available on our resource website, the Human Health Campus, which will soon come in a, with a different look and feel and with additional content. And we hope to launch this new website early next year, hopefully. Thank you very much. That's all from my side. Thank you once again. Um, um, I would uh, like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and also Dr. Cornelia. Uh, is this what I'm going to talk to you next for the next 20 minutes is actually a follow up of what Con Dr. Cornelia had spoken along with specific reference to body composition techniques in pregnancy and infancy. So now, before we start all this, why is body composition important, particularly in these age groups? Or, and as, this is because the first thousand days, which comprises of the nine months of pregnancy and the first two years of an infant's life is a critical period. It's a critical window where we can actually make changes which actually have a health, health effect later in life. Body composition changes during pregnancy are also associated with both maternal and health outcomes. Another why important reason why body composition is important is because South Asian babies are known to be of the thin fat phenotype, meaning they have a low birth weight, yet they have higher total body fat and more central fat around their waist along with having lower muscle mass and increased risk of chronic diseases. Just to show you that there are different types of body composition models, we can hang where each one varies in its assumptions and complexity. The simplest one is where we divide the body into two components, the fat and the fat-free mass. Thereby, it's called the two-compartment model then you can further split the fat-free mass into lean tissue and bone mineral content. And of course, you can go into four compartment and multi-compartment model. But adequate research has shown that the four compartment model can be considered a criterion method and gives good results. So, uh, so most of the instruments that are used are normally measure based upon the two compartment model, but just split up the body into fat, and fat mass. Before we move to methods of body composition and stable isotopic techniques in particular, I just want you to, to know the difference between two terms, accuracy and precision. Accuracy is if we have a gold term, if we have a gold standard or a criterion method, how close is the in method that we are using close to the gold standard? And the closer it is to the gold standard, the more accurate the method is. Precision is repeatability or the quality of the exact measure. Meaning, if I repeat a measurement on the same instrument, on the same person, how varied is it? Of course, if the precision or the repeatability is good for an instrument or for a method, we say that the method is good. There are different type methods of body I'm sure you are aware of skin folds, stabilizer techniques, which I'm going to go in detail, bioelectrical impedance, and the air dispute plus the smoke. Now, when we have experiments and when we have research studies, we need to decide on method do we actually use. And this decision depends on a variety of factors. So what component do we measure? Is it fat that we want to measure? Is it fat-free mass that we want to measure? Is it total body that we water that we want to measure? And also, 
what is the level of accuracy or precision that we are interested in equations that are population specific so does that equation actually fit well for a particular population it's not derived on and also like i said repeated measures is good only if the error of the instrument is within a small limit i will now move on to stable isotopic techniques uh, dr cornelia gave you a brief about the techniques but basically what is it we are using stable isotopes not radioactive isotopes stable isotopes which are stay safe and a totally non invasive method of estimating different body composition or the breast milk evaluation there are different ways in which we can use stable isotope in both health and in nutrition now um like that's as i told you we, the, they are mainly used because they are accurate they don't restrict in a person they can be done entirely on the field and they are safe the from once you do a deuterium give a deuterium dose to an individual just like dr cornelia said you can arrive at estimates of total body water and from total body water arrive at estimates of fat free mass so you give a small dose to the individual and then you take a sample post dose either at 3 hours or 4 hours and then use those cup uh, as estimates to arrive at total body water by using the mass of the tracer divided by the concentration in the pool now the good advantage of stable isotopic techniques or isotope dilution is that it's safe to use in pregnancy and in infants including newborn infants and there are new methods and machines devices that, that are available which are actually portable to analyze the samples but a word of caution especially during pregnancy is that since the hydration of fat free mass changes during pregnancy it's often advised to consider the week of gestation when we are using in to arrive at estimates of fat free mass from total body water so as i said the method is you administer a tracer either to an individual individual or an adult collect samples post collect the baseline and collect samples and analyze the tracer to arrive at total body water and from total body water you get arrive at fat free mass and then you know body weight minus fat free mass will give you the amount of fat in the body So this is the, just a plot which shows you the time after the dose, the baseline, and after the dose versus the concentration. And we are generally sampling. What are we looking for? We are looking at the concentration of the isotope and how it's decayed from the body. So the volume will be normally the do related to the dose that we gave divided by the concentration. While these methods can be very accurate, the accuracy depends on how how well and how accurately we sample how we dose the individual how is the dose weighed we need to accurately weigh the dose accurate analysis of the sample and we define the plateau by 3 to 4 hours now there uh, there has to be like i said there are certain issues that we must remember first and foremost that value i told you hydration factor varies from 0.72 to 0.74 these are from small num such studies to conduct on a small number of individuals thereby we need to use them with caution and we should remember that if we do not do primary measurements a weight giving the dose properly collecting the saliva samples properly or any sample properly it can prop the error can be propagated and we can arrive at actually a large error for a method that is accurate this is just again i'm putting up the calculations which are total body water is estimated by the dose given divided by the concentration ffm of fat free mass is tbw divided by 73% this is assumed to be the hydration factor and fat you get body weight minus fat free mass so protocol is fairly simple you take a baseline sample Uh, and then you dose the individual there are different doses for different age groups the sample can be either saliva urine or blood 
but the most commonly used sample that we use is saliva because it is easy whether in terms of the adult and it's fairly easy in terms of a baby although sometimes you may have to repeat it because the baby does not have adequate saliva but it's yet a non invasive method of um, collection and if done well the method has a good precision and repeatability there are large number there are equipment that are needed when we do it in the lab first of all we need a very good weighing scale good mass spectrometer and we need a ftir for deuteria freezer in case we are storing the sample but even before that at the field when we are doing the study there are small the things that we need a dosing bottle the dosing bottle should not be contaminated with with any previous dose because then your whole experiment goes haywire so sample collection bottles we have to have good clear labels waterproofing labels good weighing scales for measuring the body weight because your dose depends upon your body weight and of course good notes and time keeping and here i'll give you an example for if suppose you're giving a dose to a baby and the baby vom vomits or squirts squirts out a little bit of the dose then you need to note it make a note of it and that because later you will not be able to understand your results if you have not make care taken care of little notes during the experiment so good note keeping and time keeping is very very time keeping is again very important when we analyze the samples certain precautions to be taken weighing the dose don't forget your basal cell sample because if you do not take the basal sample you have actually lost your experiment administer the dose very carefully and store the sample for analysis this is very important although you give the dose a small amount of the dose should always be stored in the fridge for later use and be aware that problem can occur at every stage and be aware of the problems now this is what i is about the stable isotopic technique of deuterium to measure body composition but there is one method that i just wanted to introduce you to and that is the method of whole body potassium counting and where is that important so again this the first graph shows you that if you split up the body into fat and fat free mass and separately split up the fat free mass the fat is yellow color the fat free mass as both ecf which is extracellular fluid and what you what i want you to note is the blue one which is called the active bcm or the body cell mass so in a normal condition there is a certain proportion of fat and fat free mass in an individual if an individual is undernourished everything shrinks as you can see in the second graph but if there is a condition of both undernutrition and there is water retention or edema which occurs with undernutrition or certain clinical conditions or in, as is often seen in pregnancy and in uh, infancy then what happens is although the extracellular fluid increases and maybe the active tissue will decrease the fat free mass amount will still remain the same so deceptively you will think that the individual has doing well in terms of the fat free mass while the blue color or the active bcm or the body cell mass has actually decreased this is the and this if you actually correctly measure the body cell mass then you can get an independent measure of the metabolic tissue which is not influenced by the hydration status and this is a very accurate method of measuring body cell mass and this is the whole principle behind the whole body potassium counter we know that potassium exists in three uh, three isotopic versions potassium k40 k39 and k41 it's potassium k40 which is radioactive so and it decays and emits gamma rays so if you can actually detect the amount of gamma rays that are coming from an individual you are not giving the individual any radioactive but all of us for example as you and i are sitting wherever we are sitting 
we are emitting small amount of gamma rays, which are actually coming from the radioactive potassium in our body. So if I can measure that and measure the amount of gamma rays coming out from you, I can actually measure this metabolic tissue or the BCM in your body by the, by the various calculations that I've put up. So the, India, so, so the adults will have some amount of potassium and the infants will have some amount of potassium. And so that instrument that is known to count is, is called the whole body potassium counter. Of course, again, the accuracy of this counter will depend upon what are the detectors that I use uh, to measure these gamma counts and how is the individual position. And I will show you. And of course, how long do we measure? So again, once more to go to the, so there is an individual and the individual is having different types of isotopes. And we know that 98% of your body's potassium is present in the intracellular matter. So if, if, you, if you measure or estimate the amount of K40 or the radioactive foot 40 that is coming from your body, measure it using accurate detectors, and we use sodium iodide crystal detectors, we can use computer, we can get the counts that come out from the gamma rays and using certain calculations using a, a a, a, a individualized and a set up computer software, we can arrive at estimates of total body potassium. From total body potassium, there are standard equations by which you can arrive at body cell mass. So this is because, so you measure the amount of total body potassium and then you convert it into uh, body cell mass by constant of 0.092. This, again, I would like to reinforce that this method is very useful because it is not affect, affected by hydration status, pregnancy, infancy, clinical conditions such as malnutrition, severe acute malnutrition, cancers, renal conditions, all of these you can measure the active tissue. This is an example. So when you make a whole body potassium counter, you can either have a room which is, have, which is having detectors and you can measure, or you can have what is called a shadow shield method where you put the subject and, or the individual and you have a shadow shield. The advantage of this is that it reduces the cost. So you, as you can see from the picture, there are detectors, there is shielding. There is, the shielding is there because you don't, everything in the environment has potassium. And you do not want that to affect the values of your the individual. So you shield your detectors and you shield it from coming within the area of measurement. And thereby, so what the detectors are seeing and counting is only from the individual. So we have this is the this is the design that we had, a shadow shield design where we have a movable bed and the, uh, the person is measured in three sections. So this is the facility that we have at our research institute. You can see the movable bed. You, there are detectors. The white central part is the detectors. We have four sodium iodide crystal detectors. The more the detectors, the more is the accuracy and less is the counting time. With four detectors, we take about 30 minutes, and our, but our accuracy is within 2%. Um, but if uh, there, are, there are been sites where there are have up to 16 detectors, but these are frightfully expensive detectors, and since we could afford only four. So using this facility, we have actually measured pregnant women throughout their pregnancy and arrived at protein requirements, and based on the amount of BCM they accreted during pregnancy, arrived at protein requirements for Indian pregnant women. Right now, we are measuring the body cell mass of newborn infants. Yeah. So the little blue tub that you see there is an infant placed in the tub, a bassinet-like thing and put directly under the detectors and the infant is being measured to arrive at the body cell mass. So we are measuring the infant now from birth up to one year of age and looking at the amount of body cell mass it's putting on. Right now, it's observational, but we are looking at different interventions. We are also measuring children with cancer, with acute leukemia, 
We are measuring children with chronic renal failures. We are measuring elderly. But here again, like I told you, the advantage is we are measuring the active metabolic tissue in the body, which is not affected by hydration status. This is a recommendation to any body composition technique. Whichever method you do, you have to validate with a good criterion method or a gold standard. Have clear standard operative procedures. Know your errors and work within your errors. If you are doing multicentric studies, make sure that it is validated, your instrument is validated in the same way and have clear ideas of, like I said, of your errors. The problems you will have is that if, if your simple measurement like body weight is taken wrong, it can completely alter the results of your body composition, however good your method is. So primary measurements matter as much as the method. In certain measurements, if you move, there are, there are going to be problems, especially in babies. But again, the potassium counter have this advantage that it is not affected by hydration status and it is not affected by movement artifacts. Be aware that if you're using any method that uses predictive prediction equation, make sure that that equation fits your population. And finally, to conclude, body composition, like Dr. Cornelia said, is very important. It is important to not just stop at body weight and simple anthropometric measures. If you have the provision, please measure body composition because they have shown that body composition has, plays a very critical role in health and disease. Stable isotopic techniques are a safe, non-invasive method of body composition. You have to be aware of the assumptions and the limitations that you're working with. We do a lot of work with IAE and we are the IAE Collaborating Center for Nutrition. We have been since 2010, and we are very happy to co collaborate with IA and do stable isotopic techniques, not in body composition, in uh, dose to mother technique, in breast milk evaluation, in micronutrient estimations. And um, so uh, it, is, it is a privilege to work with IAEA. And I would also like to say that, end by saying that body composition is critical when you're monitoring growth or even any health or clinical condition. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Prof. Ahmad Sulaiman. Also, thank you to Professor Hardinsa and the committee. It's great pleasure for me to be invited to this symposium. Distinguished invited speaker, Dr. Cornelia, Professor Rebecca, Dr. Tetra, participants, ladies and gentlemen, Good afternoon. My title of presentation is Assessment of Human Milk Intake by Breastfed Infant Using Deuterium Oxide Dose to Mother Technique in Tumbuh Kembang Anak Kohor, Indonesia. This research was conducted in collaboration among National Nuclear Energy Agency of Indonesia, Batan, Ministry of Health, and IEAA in 2015-2017. Uh, as an introduction, Indonesia is an archipelago country with the total population was around uh, 2019, tw 280, 268 million in 2019, and the number of children under five years was around 23 million. This fact encourages the government to work hard to care the health of children under five, especially for children in the province outside of Java. The orange one uh, were the provinces had the stunting less than 20%, yellow, red, and dark blue for the provinces had the stunting more than 20%. The result basic health research 2013 something children was was 37 percent and in in 2018 was 30.8 uh, percent 
in this graph so the underweight stunting wasting children from 2013 uh, decreased to 27.6% uh, uh, in 2019 in 20 uh, at the uh, right side we can see the uh, stunting prevalence of children under five years uh, decrease uh, in 2018 it is 32.8 for the children under two years 29.9 uh, .9. uh, this graph uh, up about exclusive respect rates by province in Indonesia in 2017. Indonesia, uh, the exclusive respect, uh, Indonesia value 61.6%. Uh, uh, but there was, there were uh, still 19 uh, provinces uh, have uh, the exclusive breast rate under uh, 61%, including uh, West Java, uh, still 40, uh, 55.4. Uh, this is the table. Uh, I'm sorry, stable isotope deuterium had been used. Uh, by some country, there were 12 countries uh, that had used deuterium oxide dilution a technique to assess uh, exclusive breastfeeding since 1986 to 2017. Uh, this the dairy result. They determine the uh, human milk in text per day, data open were maternal maternal body mass index, percent body fat of uh, mother, and then uh, they could not, they could know uh, the <coughs> exclusive of uh, the infant. The weight of breast milk intake uh, consumed by infant from five hundred. Uh, around 500 until nine nine hundred of 55. In the research project in RAS uh, from each country, including Indonesia, had been trained how to prepare the deuterium oxide and saliva sampling technique, etc. Uh, the target of subject numbers each uh, country was 30 pairs, uh, mother and infant from three and uh, six month age who recruited from their birth. The objective of this research uh, to measure human meat intake, Indonesia infant during for six months to access breastfeeding practice of mother and our study design, the human milk intake infant at three and six months according mother report uh, of infant feeding. So uh, using the deuterium oxide, we, we can determine uh, the classification of uh, the exclusive breastfeeding or predominant or a partial breastfeeding uh, feed, uh, of the infant. Uh, the study was approved uh, by Ethical Review Committee of Ministry of Health, Jakarta, Indonesia. This, uh, the criteria of respondent, inclusion criteria, mother who exclusive breastfeeding, parity no more than three, infant age, three months plus minus seven days, normal nutrition status, and the exclusion criteria, twin baby or more, low birth weight, uh, less than 2.5 kilogram, baby with oedema, mother, with blood retention disease, mother with smoking and drinking alcohol. The research activity, uh, respondent requirement had been done in Tumbuk Kembang Anak Kohor in Bogor City, West Java, Indonesia. It was established in uh, 
2011. Research activity were socialization to respondent, anthropometry data collection, selection of respondents. There were uh, 30 uh, pairs, mothers and in infant, age three and six months, and then interview to the mother by using questionnaire. That is uh, the to mother technique for assessing the human milk intake. The infant will get uh, human milk from her or his mother. This figure saw the curve. Uh, the concentration of the thorium oxide uh, decreased. Uh, this for, from saliva mother. This the under a curve from saliva infant, uh, the mother, uh, the thorium in saliva mother decrease, the in the saliva infant increase, and then uh, this material and equipment, uh, we got uh, the thorium oxide and equipment from IEA, glove, uh, siri, tubes, Etc. Uh, saliva collection and isotope analysis. Predos uh, uh, at first day, saliva sampling for baseline. Uh, we collect the saliva 1.5 until 2 milliliter. And then uh, about uh, 3 and 3 to 4 hour after after eh no uh, and then uh, directly after base sampling uh, mother was given the 10 gram deuterium orally administered and then three until four hour post dose uh, we we uh, to do the sampling saliva again and then the in the second day three four and then 13 for the, this the period two weeks uh, for sem, saf, saliva sampling and then uh, the thorium stable in saliva uh, analyze using IRMS then the statistic uh, had done in excel spreadsheet from IAAA CRP it is the photograph of saliva collection and deuterium administration. Uh, this is the waking of deuterium oxide. And then this uh, takes saliva from infant. We're using the cotton, cotton stick. Yeah. We be careful to don't hurt the baby mouth. And then from two mother also we 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 took the saliva using ball cotton cotton ball was uh it is a uh, mother uh, we move into the searing and then press and then we collect the saliva in the test tube and then uh after take the baseline we give the deuterium oxide 10 gram and then the rinse twice. This uh, deuterium oxide analysis using IRMS uh, at St. John Research Institute, Bangalore, India, uh, the office in uh, the office of uh, Professor Rebecca. Uh, this uh, the preparation of saliva in tube. We, uh, they put the platinum to reduction. It is uh, using uh, sample auto auto automatic this IRMS. It is the result. The data in this table one. Uh, body uh, we we see the mean of body weight of mother was fifty nine and head one hundred fifty. Their age. Uh, from 20 until 40 years yes here there was there were two respondent uh, more than 40 years the parity uh, here the infant uh, were most as second 
second and third uh, child and mother education from primary until university. Uh, most of them from senior high school. Uh, they are housewife, uh, one respondent work. It is the table in fun characteristic, characteristic. There were 13 boys and 17 girls as the respondent mean of body was 5.5 .5 until 6.6 .6 at three months and 6.5 until seven age at six months. Their length also uh, increase. Their BMI boys also increase, but BMI of the girl uh, were constant until six months. They have been growing well, so on their way again and the body length also increase up to six months. This, uh, the infant mother that are, uh, are, in, are input into Excel sheets from IAAA. Uh, we, we, we fill the, this sheet uh, with the mother and infant data. Also, date of saliva collection, the time we have to record it, and then automatically we we obtain the human milk intake for this uh, for this infant. Uh, 800, 820, 22 gram per day, and non milk or intake, <clears throat> 104 gram per day. It is the Curve, the mother curve decrease, the infant curve uh, increase. So, and then at the 13 and 14, uh, they decrease. Uh, this table, the result of statistic open, uh, total body water of mother about uh, the mean of uh, 34.6 at three months and then 35.9 at six months. Fat mass person uh, 18.4 and then decrease at six months 15.5. Kinetic data of infant, human milk intake uh, consumed by infant, uh, the average uh, 784. 84 and then uh, relative constant and at six months still seven seven hundred eighty seven gram per day and the non milk oral intake for three and one hundred forty at six months this uh if we if we I use the cutoff, uh, cutoff ex exclusive breastfeeding was uh, less than 25 gram water per day. So uh, if the infant have uh, non-milk oral intake uh, more than 25, the infant was classified predominant breastfeeding of 10 uh, this table. If uh, this uh, next uh, table for human make intake and grow the, bo the boy and girl in fun. We can, we can see here uh, from the uh, birth week uh, at three months age, the babe, the boy uh, we get, have we gain 23 gram per day, girl 14 gram per day. At six months, uh, boy uh, five gram per day and then girl seven gram per day. Maybe uh, they began have many activity here. In this figure, it is a uh, 
similar in range uh, compared the other the other country here uh, the result uh, we got the in uh, at three month age uh, baby we have uh, exclusive breastfeeding 11 and at months each month only one infant are uh, still exclusive breastfeeding uh, this the uh, report from uh, researcher from Thailand uh, they they said uh, cutoff uh, about 25 is too restrictive so they use the cutoff 86.6 gram per day so they have uh, this uh, if, if if I use this cutoff uh, our Indonesia infant exclusive so uh, increase 25 now we in conclusion the make intake Indonesia infant during our uh, first uh, six months uh, classified sufficient 77 77 percent uh, using the jury mother technique uh, the infant were categorized as exclusive exclusive respect uh, about 37 percent then only 3.3% oh, at a six month age. It is using cutoff 25 gram per day. The percent fat, uh, the mother Indonesia will like this uh, lower than reported in Sri Lanka and Brazil using the same method methodology. Exclusive uh, breastfeed practice 30 pairs for of mother infant still so that it had not been properly adhered to by mother who delivered babies. It's uh, recommended that mother and baby health officer in Indonesia should be increasing promoting in other mother in uh, urban rural area to breastfeed exclusively to their infant of six months ex. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Pak Suleiman. Uh, everybody can hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon for everyone. I'm very happy to be here together with our colleague in nutrition to share our experience using stable isotope technique in nutrition area. Uh, I also say thank you to Pergisi Pangan and organizer that already give me an opportunity to invite us to participate in this webinar series. Today, I will present about the assessment of breast milk consumption by a stable isotope technique for improving breastfeeding practice and the policy. Uh, let me share the screen. Um, first of all, this is uh, my presentation for today. Okay, I will continue my presentation. Uh, we already know about the definition of exclusive breastfeeding. Uh, it means uh, we giving feeding babies with breast milk soon after birth until six months of age without any additional or replacement of food or drink. WSN and UNICEF also recommendes, recommended to support exclusive breastfeeding by initiate early breastfeeding or we call in Indonesia with EMD, the first hour after birth and breastfeed exclusively by not feeding any other food or drink, including water. Uh, we also breastfeeding on babies demands um, day and night and never use or start away from giving bottle of milk as well as pacifier. The government of Indonesia also has issued several regulations on exclusive breastfeeding start year 2011 that uh, the Ministry of Health recommend 10 steps towards successful breastfeeding. Uh, the steps such as uh, 
policy on breastfeeding to be communicated to all health staff and providing mothers with the information and education about the benefit of breast milk. Uh, we also need to providing support to mother for breastfeeding, no giving pacifier to baby, and also uh, forming support for group for exclusive breastfeeding at the community level. Uh, in year 2012, the presidential regulation uh, about exclusive breastfeeding during the first six months of life. And then in year 2014, the Ministry of Health Regulation number 15, uh, giving administrative sanction towards anyone or any party who prevents successful exclusive breastfeeding. This is uh, Indonesian situation about exclusive breastfeeding. This data uh, I take from basic health research conducted years 2010, 2013, and 2018 that uh, we ask to mother that their babies got only breast milk during last 24 hours. Yeah. This figure shows that the percentage of baby who exclusive breastfeed is increasing. The percentage in year 2018 is higher than 2010 or 27. However, there is a tendency of decrease of exclusive breastfeeding as babies get older. This trend was shown in survey in all years, 2010, 2013, or 2018. As Ibu Armin explained that in year 2015, uh, Balit Bankes and Batan have a collaboration to conduct a study to assess breast milk consumption. This study is supported by IAEA. Uh, we use a stable isotope technique where to see mother baby pair with babies three months of age with uh, the participant in this study and we follow through until the baby reach six months of age. How the measurement was done has been explained by uh, Ibuk Ermin. So I, I don't need to repeat that. Yeah. This is the result uh, from the study. We look, uh, we found that the breast milk consumption when the babies are three months old is not different where the, uh, from the time when the babies reach six months of old. Um, we can look at this uh, graph, but the mass breast milk quantity is 784 gram per day, a meal per day. When the babies reach six months, the consumption is 787 meal per day. We can say uh, the consumption almost the same quantity at three months of age and six months of age. Using stable isotope, we can know how much consumption comes from non-breast milk. During this study, we found consumption non-breast milk, uh, the average 43 meal per day at three months of age and increased to 140 meal per day they, when they were six months. Oh. So from this data, we could see that consumption breast milk 784 ml per day is equal to 556 calories per day with assumption um, 70 calories per 100 ml breast milk. That uh, this consumption actually met with the recommended daily allowance for baby, uh, 550 calories per day. Um, but 
as we explained before, non-milk oral intakes tend to increase. Uh, this consumption of non-breast milk increased three times when the baby reached six months. Using stable isotope techniques, we have the benefit uh, because we can we being able to calculate the quantitative consumption of breast milk, and then uh, we can calculate the nutrition content based on nutrition composition of breast milk. And then we can compare to the needs of baby based on recommend, uh, RDA. It would be better to assess the consumption of babies, not only using the stable of isotope tennis. Then it becomes uh, when we combine with the 24 recall, it could be giving more information about the type of liquid orally given. This information could be beca become the basis for the de developing um, educational material, not for parents, but uh, for other family members. As described by Ibu Katrin, the role of isotope Technique uh, to assess do mother give breastfeed exclusivity to the baby. If we found that uh, a lot of non milk oral intake, so we need to accompany with uh, other technique like focus group discussion or in the interview uh, that we can understand the barrier or constraint for. Uh, exclusive breastfeeding practice from the mother. This activity is important when we develop the strategy, uh, we develop a strategy or we develop a project to improve exclusive breastfeeding coverage at community level. Yeah. For the last, uh, let us remember that stable is sort of technique is to objectively measure uh, the breast milk consumption if the babies have exclusive breastfeed. Other methods like 24-hour recall, in-depth interview, or focus, focus group discussion are needed to improve breastfeeding practice or to provide support for mother for increasing this important practice during the first six months of life. Okay, thank you. Maybe that is uh, our presentation.